Yeah. So you can see that we have a Y hat, a Y with a funny hat over it, and then AX plus B. Now, I know you're used to seeing lines as being Y equals MX plus B. Why would they choose A and B instead of MX plus B? It's a mystery to me, but I know that it's universally accepted in statistics uh, to the point where uh, your calculators, if they do regression at all, if they do any linear regression, they will have A and B on them, and A will be the slope, and B will be the y-intercept. But this Y with the funny hat over it does have a meaning which I think is something you should know. This is the estimator for Y. We're, you know, we realize that a regression is really a model for the real world. It's not an exact predictor. So when we plug in a value for X into our equation to generate a value, we know that it's not part of the data. It's data. It's it's numbers coming from the equation. So uh, y hat is known as the best estimator for y or just the estimator for y. And then uh, a and b, well, a is, as I just said, the slope. Um, and of course, uh, it turns out that, you know, if you have a negative correlation, I think it follows that you'll have a negative slope. And if you have a positive correlation, uh, you'll have something like a positive slope, except you have to learn to separate. Not you have to learn not to confuse uh, slope with correlation, even though they seem to behave the same. Slope is slope, and correlation is correlation, and the slope takes more data into account and more more parts of the data into account, whereas the slope just looks at the st as to the variance divided by the standard deviation on x, and that's all it looks at. So the slope uh, is a little simpler than Pearson's R. And by the way, the good news is to find, this, to find the regression equation, you don't need to do anything new with the table that you learned about in the last presentation that I gave you. Uh, as for B, B is the y-intercept. And we find the y-intercept the way you would find that with any linear equation. You know that in grade 9 and in grade 10, when you found out part of the information for a line and you're almost able to come up with the whole equation what you what you often needed if you like if you already knew the slope for example you needed one other piece of information beside the slope so you find the slope from your data great but you need a slope and a point to complete the equation for the line so uh, you need a point, but because how do you know what point lies exactly on the line if you haven't come up with the line yet? So you get a chicken and egg problem, you know, where um, you haven't really made the line yet because you don't know what points are on there. All you know are data points, and you can't go pretending that one of your points lies on the line which you don't even know what it is yet. So what you do is you take your average on X and your average on Y. So X bar and Y bar become a point on the regression line. That's generally the accepted way to do it. Okay, So you make your point on the regression line. Your one point that you know for sure on the re regression line is that point X bar, Y bar, because you know it's the average of X and Y, and it, it ought to be on that line. Okay, And OK, so then we come up with these computations of X. I know the book gives you one way of doing it. I give you two. Take your pick, okay? In fact, when I work out my examples, I will show you using both equations that the answers are very, very close within a small margin of error. So for slope, you need the covariance, SXY, divided by the variance on S, X, SX squared, okay? So um, the slope A is just this this uh, sum from the covariance divided by the variance on x. And the other way to do it, the machine formula, really amounts to the same thing. You're just putting your covariance on top, which becomes this rather strange looking thing here. And this other strange thing on the bottom is nothing more than your variance on x, if you recall. Uh, and they were divided by n squared and so on. Okay. So once A is found, um, once your slope is found, 
the variable for your y-intercept can be calculated just using x-bar and y-bar. And so, and once, once you have all that, now you got your line, your regression line, y equals ax plus b. What do you use it for? Well, the great thing is about statistics and about lines and about any kind of polynomial function model is that you can use that model to predict what will happen given different data that you haven't seen before. You can actually use it as a predictor. The one drawback is that you cannot go too far from the data. You know, if, you're, if your data range is sort of from here to here, you can't go way off in the distance for a lot of things. Like for example, well, let's say that you're, you're taking a bunch of uh, marks from students who got accepted into university, and let's say that they were their each student's average score from high school, right? And you plotted that against their average in their first year of university. And quite often, you know, uh, the university students in their first year take a bit of a hit in their mark. Well, okay, fine. Well, what would the y-intercept mean there? So, and all your points are there between 75 and 100 for high school. Well, what would a what would a y-intercept mean there? Uh, I mean, it would be it would it would mean what would your university average score be if your high school mark was zero? Obviously, you can't use that data. This is a a stark example of predicting too far back from your data. You know, you're okay between say 80 and 100 or whatever. Okay, but you're not okay drawing that line all the way back to a mark of zero, which is just ridiculous, or even a mark below 60, for that matter. Okay, so once A is found, the variable B can be calculated by allowing x equals x bar and y hat equals y. Remember, y hat, it's our estimator, and we're going to use bar y uh, in, in its place um, on the regression line. And once both are calculated, we get that. And okay, let's do a um, let's do a problem, uh, problem number five on page 180, using standard formulas. These are the heights and masses of various people who fight fires or whatever, or fire fire department trainees. And you can see their heights are in in the x column. Their mass is in the y column. So um, create a scatter. Now you can ask yourself, is, is that right to call them y and x or maybe x and y or something? Um, does height depend on mass or does mass depend on height? It's not a 100% magical answer here. Um, it's quite likely that taller people weigh more and they weigh more because they're taller, <laughs> you know? And it could be that, okay, maybe you might run into somebody who's short and very chubby or, or tall and very skinny. It, those are possible, right? Um, but you have to think as a generality. You have to think as a general trend, not, not in terms of the outliers. So um, I, I would imagine to me the height would be the independent variable. The mass would be the dependent variable. You know, if you're trying to make a, some kind of assertion that taller people are heavier, smaller people are lighter. You know, if you're trying to make those statements, then you're, what you're really saying is that the lighter or that the mass of the person is the dependent variable and the height of the person is the independent variable. So um, here's my next slide. Here's what I did with that data. So I basically... Because this was from a PDF, I just cut and pasted it from the PDF onto another electronic sheet, which I proceeded to write on with my handwriting. Uh, I don't, I don't have the software that used to do this handwriting stuff anymore, which is sad. But there you go. There's, there's what I did. I did uh, mass versus height. I did a table. I did my x minus bar x, y minus bar y. I squared the x minus bar x column and put the results here. The sum of those squares, of course, when you divide by n minus 1, they make your variance on x. So then you did the same with y minus bar y. You squared this column over here, and the total you got, the sum you got from that column, was your variance on y. Then you had your covariance. Now the magical part about covariance is that some of these numbers will be negative and some of them will be positive. And when you add them together, it's anybody's guess whether the result would be negative or positive, but I can, 
you can tell by looking that there's only since there's only one negative number and that negative number is like pretty small um, in magnitude that you're going to wind up with something overwhelmingly positive and it turns out to be 123.66 so it's quite a quite a big number and then uh, we divide we divide by the square root of the variance on x times the square root of the variance on y to get our Pearson's r and the Pearson's r turns out to be 0.654 now, if you recall, for a strong correlation, 0.666 is supposed to be, or two-thirds, is supposed to be the borderline between medium and strong, and this is below that borderline. 0.654 is a moderate correlation, so we have to classify it as that. And then we computed A. Well, A was our covariance, 123.66, divided by our variation our variance on x to 79.72 when we divided that we got 0.442 now as we said in the earlier slide that it's no surprise that a positive r should lead to a positive a a negative r should lead to a negative a um, and so then we fit that into our line line equation we rearrange our terms to fit in bar x and bar y to compute the y-intercept we got a y-intercept of 5.59. So the regression equation is 0.4421x plus 5.56. That's for the estimator on y. And I wrote it in a bit of a nicer way here using typeface, using y hat, because I didn't use y hat when I wrote it out. And this is just a scanned image. So let's go to the next uh, one. This is using the machine formulas. Notice you have fewer columns uh, but an uglier equation. I just, in my in my opinion, the the equations for the machine formulas are just uglier. But yeah, they they take fewer columns on a table. I, I got to give it that. And I got an answer for y that, within some rounding error, is pretty much the same answer. It's 0.655 for my Pearson's r. And if you remember, I got 0.654. I'm not off by much at all. And 0.4421, I think, was the 0.4421 was the exact answer for my A, but 0.442 was the one that I got using um, using the uh, alternative solution. Uh, the y-intercept was 0.5, oh, sorry, 5.56, and this one ended up being 5.51. So none of these were really off by a whole lot. Um, I, I'm quite confident that both, I, I would treat both of these methods as being equally good, equally strong, and I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't stop at doing either one of them. Uh, I know a lot of students like this one better. They like, because it makes sense to them. It makes sense to me too, um, only because you have this idea where you have the covariance divided by the variance, and you saw at least you saw a, a, a bit of that in chapter two, and so there's some familiarity with these formulas, whereas this crazy ass new formula with the um, the multiple summations and stuff, um, you know, it takes less of a table, but it's a little more confusing for students, and even uh, a little more confusing to make sense of what you're doing. Uh, that's my opinion, and I know that's the opinion of a lot of students. Um, I don't know what your opinion is. Of course, you might you might have your own opinion there, but like I say, I just leave it up to you to choose whichever one you want to take. So uh, the rest of the uh, questions are answered here. Uh, we did create the scatter plots. We answered questions A and B on the last slide using two methods. Oh, we didn't do, we didn't actually create a scatter plot, by the way. Um, to create a scatter plot, yes, you would have to plot the points in a graph. But when you plot the points in the graph, you're not putting a line in because you don't know what the line is yet on part A, right? You don't know the, you don't know what the line is until you do part B. <laughs> part B is where you actually do that, and of course we did that twice here with two different methods. Part C: predict the mass of a trainee whose height is 165 centimeters. Now this is a really good question because this allows you to use your model to make a prediction which is really the whole point of doing all this, making predictions, right? So um, 
we did it, and when I did it, I came up with roughly 78.1 kilograms, or 78.065 to be exact. And I'm using my, I'm using the slightly, you know, uh, I'm, I'm using the first formula that we, that we discussed. And then predict the height of a 79 kilogram trainee. Oh, now, given the weight, what's the height? The height, remember, was the input value. And the weight was the output value, but now we got to turn it around and make the uh, y hat the input value and the output value being the uh, height. Well, it turns out that it works out to pretty close to 166 centimeters. It might even be exactly that much. And then when you look at the data, it, it did ask us to look at the data that we actually computed and notice that a 79 kilogram a uh, firefighter trainee has a height of 175 and what did we say we said 166 well it turned out that the a, an actual person weighing that much was taller than we predicted uh, of course it, uh, part e does say explain any discrepancy between part d and the actual height of that person that we saw on the table well uh, we're not taking into account what i said right when we started the discussion that some people could be short and short and stout, short and chubby, or tall and tall and very skinny kind of thing. You could you could have the you could have both, and really we weren't taking these individual differences into account. We were just using the model to predict, and pretty much on average, we would say, yeah, if, if you weighed 79 kilograms, you'd probably more or less be 166 on average. But there was no way you'd be able to know from any particular person. So rem it just reminds us that uh, model uh, using models uh, to predict anything at all is just that. It's a model, and we have to remember not. We have to always remember that you know the world is a little more complex than our models would would have us believe, and to not put too much faith in models, but uh, to put enough faith in them that. They be, you know, if you put a little bit of faith in them and not too much faith in them, they become quite useful for making predictions uh, and making general broad statements. Now, uh, what I wanted to also discuss, this section here that you see in front of you is a section which is not being covered. We do not do nonlinear regression in this course. Other kinds of strange regressions outside of linear regression is covered under other courses like you'll you'll see it in um, you'll see it being used in advanced functions um, you, you see exponential regression used in grade 11 uh, it's used in a lot of places so we're just concentrating on linear regression and um, the, the the thing is when you I know when you did this in grade 12 or or when you did the exponential regression in grade 11 if your teacher had you do it. Um, you probably used a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet was the one that generated the equation. Um, you may have had your teacher tell you, oh, I still want you to make a, a regression formula. Those are considerably more difficult to do by hand. They're, those are really difficult to do. Um, and usually are done by statistics majors in university. So they're, they're not the kind of things you would do without a math package if you're in high school. So pretty much it's, uh, it's not something we cover in this course and we never have covered it in, in my years of teaching it. So we're just going to skip over 3.3. We're going to go to 3.4. It's my favorite topic, cause and effect. Um, the main lesson to come away with in this section is that um, correlation is not causation. You know, just because, just because you say that a fireman's height is related or correlated moderately to their mass, their body mass, it doesn't mean that height causes more body mass. To use the word cause, especially when you're talking about people, takes a huge, huge scientific leap. You know, when you say two things are correlated, yeah, you can put them on a line. You, 
you can, what you're saying is that, yeah, I can fit it on a regression line and I can make predictions based on if, if, if someone measures something on some measurement amount on one variable, then I can predict what the other variable is going to be. Uh, that's, a, that's a nice trick, but that's a, that's a long, long bus ride from saying, um, <laughs> and a train ride, and a plane ride, that height causes mass. You know, that's, that's a ridiculous statement. Um, maybe it does, but the amount of medical knowledge you would have to invest in that would be just crazy. Um, many years ago, um, back as far back as the 1940s, maybe slightly post-war, somebody in England figured out that, hey, Smoking might cause cancer, and smoke, or, or, or he was a little more cautious. He was saying smoking might be bad for you, and um, and that was because he took he gathered his statistics together, medical statistics, and uh, smoking versus like the incidence of lung cancer, and he the data he gathered together seemed to have a strong correlation between smoking and go getting ill, you know, getting various types of lung cancer or some other kind of breathing disorder uh, or circulation disorder or whatever. And the study, like I said, showed a strong correlation, as you probably would have thought. And it's not that nobody listened to it. It's just that people started asking questions. Well, you know, you know, what if it isn't that smoke? Maybe, maybe it's not smoking that causes cancer. Maybe it's something else that smokers do that causes cancer, or maybe it's something else about people's lifestyle. Surely it can't be smoking. Every, you know, nearly, you know, a lot of people smoke. A substantial part of the population did a lot of smoking. You know, you have to consider those questions. I mean, as a, as a scientist, if you have no answer ready for those kind of criticisms, then all you can do is go back to the lab and see what the answers are. And it took scientists about 60 to 70 years, seven decades, working all over the world. And one day, the Surgeon General in the United States, the United States Surgeon General back in, say, I think or around maybe the mid-90s or early 2000s, finally said, smoking causes cancer. No one ever said that before. That's a, you know, when you say smoking causes cancer, and especially when the Surgeon General, the, the person who sets the policy for medical practice all across the country says something as momentous as smoking causes cancer, all of a sudden that changes the whole picture of how smoking has to be managed. Now it has to be managed as a health problem. It causes cancer. Well, you certainly don't want to be next to a smoker because you're breathing in that smoke too and you don't want cancer. So then they started passing laws saying you're not allowed to smoke in restaurants, you're not allowed to smoke in bars, you can't smoke in public buildings, uh, you can't smoke in offices. The laws, as they are now, are strong, but they're strong because someone very high up in the government said smoking causes cancer, right? They use the C word. It's just something scientists don't do without a, lot, a great deal of caution. It's a big, big word, okay? So um, cause and effect, you know, um, you, ha you have to, cause and effect can be very tricky. Like, for example, um, there's this academic guy who's a, I guess he's, he was a nutrition professor. And uh, he, he basically did a study where he gathered the data worldwide counting the telephone poles in each country, divide by the population, and then related that data to the amount of colon cancer per 100,000 people in those same populations. It appeared as though, 
where the numbers of telephone poles showed a high density, there were high rates of colon cancer. And where the number of telephone poles were a very low density, where there were hardly any, there were very low rates of colon cancer, almost non-existent. So you can imagine jumping to the conclusion that, hey, very few telephone poles, not much colon cancer. Lots of telephone poles, lots of colon cancer. This is real, guys. I'm not, I'm not making this up. And this isn't InfoWars. I'm, uh, I'm not a shill for uh, what, what's his name in InfoWars. <laughs> this is real. I'll explain. <laughs> and you'll be convinced. Okay. All right, so th this is this is the problem. You have <coughs> these these numbers, these numbers here, which are telling you, oh, there's these you know low numbers here, low incident, low low x here, x, y is low, high high x here, y is high. Oh, there's a correlation. Oh, that must mean x causes y. That telephone poles are caused by colon cancer. And it turned out that the countries where, that had low telephone pole counts and low colon cancer counts were third world countries. Countries that were very, very poor. Countries that were very, very wealthy had lots of telephone poles and high rates of colon cancer, enormous rates of colon cancer. So, you know, I, I, those telephone poles are causing it. You mark my words. I'm kidding. So anyway... Um, But then someone else chimed in and said, well, you know what? You could count the toasters that people own in each household per 100,000 people, and it would correlate the same way with the colon cancer compared with the countries in the third world. Or what about the number of television sets? Or, I mean, you could, you could say toasters cause colon cancer, or you could say you're getting your colon cancer from your TV set. Or maybe, maybe it's your stereo system that's causing colon cancer. Or maybe it's that nice, fast car you drive that's causing colon cancer. Because there's more of them here than there is over there. And <laughs> so now we have lots of crazy correlations, which are absolutely true. It turns out colon cancer is a disease of the industrialized world. It's not really a third world disease. What if we turned the logic around? What if we said that, hey, you know what? Those people in the third world have high rates of hunger and low counts of telephone poles. And maybe the hunger is caused by a telephone pole deficiency and we should end world hunger by shipping our telephone poles, our excess telephone poles to the third world. That would be just as crazy, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that would be just as insane. Okay, right. Um, so, as, as I've alluded, really, all of these things taken together, the toasters, the television sets, the refrigerators, the, the fast cars, all of that taken together are things the third world has in abundance and the sorry, that the first world has in abundance and the third world has in a great shortage, okay? And so one then concludes that it's not the, the telephone poles never did cause the colon cancer. The telephone pole, that, sorry, the colon cancer caused by first world affluence, by first world wealth, which causes us to afford to buy lots of food and we overeat and we get colon cancer. Mm -hmm. People who don't eat enough never get to that point. They never get to the point where they get colon cancer, but they get other things because they lack food. So um, now we're back to the real world. See, I told you, I told you this would all make sense at the end. So cause and effect is something that you that can be very, very tricky. Very, very tricky. And, um, you know, two things could look like they're going, to, going together like bang bu gangbusters, but really it's something else that's causing the two to happen together. That's called a common cause uh, thing, and that's actually described in the book over here. 
there is like the common cause factor. So it's an external variable that causes two variables that increase or decrease together. So for example, um, you know, uh, suppose that a town finds its revenue from parking fees at the beach each summer correla correlates with the local tomato harvest. Oh yeah, you know, uh, if we can make more cars park at the beach, we can have a bumper crop of tomatoes next year. Makes no sense at all, does it? No, because both are caused by good weather, right? You want to park your car at the beach because you want to go to the beach because it's good weather. Tomatoes, they grow in good weather. Good weather is causing both of them to happen. That's common cause. And that is the thing behind telephone poles and quashiorcor and marasmus and what have you, and overeating and obesity and colon cancer. But of course, the normal... The normal state of affairs, if we want to say that X causes Y because X is correlated with Y, is to say it's a cause and effect relationship. Sometimes you can get away with that. Maybe in physics, you can, it's a, these things are a little easier to conclude. So a change in X produces a change in Y. It doesn't just, it's not just correlated with a change in Y. It will produce a change in Y. It will cause a change in Y. So such relationships are sometimes clearly evident especially in physical processes. For example, an increasing height uh, from which you drop an object increases its impact velocity. See, I told you, physics, right? Anyway, um, then you have reverse cause and effect. This is one of those things that, you see I'm drinking coffee here? Don't worry, it's decaf. Now, does drinking coffee make you nervous or do nervous people drink coffee? That's the kind of thing we're wondering about when we talk about reverse cause and effect. Does coffee make you nervous or do nervous people drink coffee? Yeah, cause, that's reverse cause and effect. It's unclear which causes which one, right? And um, maybe, maybe the coffee makes you nervous. Some people fall asleep when they drink coffee. It's probably because they put too much sugar in it, but whatever. That's the opposite of what you expect. Then you have an accidental relationship where a correlation does exist, but you don't know what the heck's going on here. That's crazy. Like, in other words, you can't think of a common cause factor, so it's just kind of hanging there, right? For example, the number of females enrolled in undergraduate engineering programs and the number of reality TV shows both increased over the past several years. Who the heck knows how they're correlated? Uh, I'm sure one doesn't cause the other, and not sh it's not clear what factor is causing the two to happen together. Right? Not clear. Presumed relationship? Well, a correlation doesn't really seem to be accidental even though we can't figure out, you know, a cause and effect or a common cause factor. So let's say you find a correlation between people's level of fitness and the uh, adventure movies, a number of adventure movies that were previously watched. Um, so a physically fit person might prefer adventure movies, but it would be difficult to find a common cause or prove that one variable affects the other. So you can go over the examples, like, you know, ask yourself these questions and then look at the solutions for explanations and so on. They're kind of fun to do. Um, also, uh, there's a discussion here about the difference between an experimental group and a control group. Of course, whenever you do, um, whenever you do a study, you want to do a control group for which nothing is being done. This is true of drug studies as well, you know, where you... Um, you know, you're studying dosages, so if the dosage of a drug causes a certain change in something else, uh, you want to be able to measure that. But, of course, you also want to measure against a control group for which you ha administered no drug at all and see how it compares against nothing at all. This is mostly, as you can see, this, this section is mostly reading up and stuff. It's... Um, and studying definitions. That's really pretty much it. Um, I would do the questions in section A, and I wouldn't do, I wouldn't go a heck of a lot past that. I mean, maybe, maybe try number seven, perhaps. There's one more section that we want to do, and that's critical analysis. This is, um, 
this is a section where um, we look at strangeness in, uh, in a linear correlation and try to explain it. Okay. Now, it may be that now there, there are a couple of factors that may cause that, which we will discuss here. Um, for one thing, you can see how, for example, let's say that a manager wants to know if an, a test score and an aptitude test correlates with productivity, right? The manager who wants to know this doesn't have a lot of time to enter all this data into his computer. So what he does is he enters only five pieces of data into the computer and comes up with this rather neat looking line here, uh, which shows productivity versus test score. And you can see that, boy, for all, the, for all you know, the, um, the correlation looks pretty good. And then when you see the results on a computer, the R, the R value, the Pearson's R, is 0.978, which is a really, that points to a very, very extremely strong correlation. The only problem is, maybe he had more time later on that day, and he entered the rest of the data in. So here's what he got. There you go. Can you see any correlation there? How does it compare with this one? Right? This one looks really nice. But when you enter all of the data in, that's what you get. This is the first lesson you learn in if you want to do any serious study in correlation. If you want to do any serious study of your own in correlation, you need a scientific sample. And what we mean by a scientific sample is a sample of at least 20 subjects or at least 20 measurements. You have to enter all 20 in because really all this happened to be he chose maybe every fifth or sixth or seventh uh, test score uh, and chose five of them using just systematic uh, sampling and it just turned out by pure randomness by sheer fluke those points all lined up or more or less they pretty strongly lined up on on the uh, regression line but as you can see here uh, any regression line you come up from this data won't show much of anything. Let's see what the regression is here. 0 0.154. 0 0.154 is a very weak correlation. In fact, it's so close to zero, you might as well say there's no correlation to anything. That the test scores and product that the test scores are not a good predictor of productivity. And that's what you have to conclude when you take into consideration all of the data. When you take into consideration all of the data, what you're doing is you're mitigating the effects, you're lessening the effects of randomness in your data. So now you're seeing really what the real situation looks like. The more data you gather, the more realism you put into your situation. Now, of course, you one is often uh, restricted by various factors that cause them to not uh, gather as much data as they would like. For example, funding, you know, or time. Like, for example, if you're, uh, if you're a polling agency and you're doing political polls, well, they're time sensitive. They're usually connected with the news of the day. And you don't want to wait around a week or two weeks before you come up with, you know, 10,000 subjects that will give you a very certain outcome. No, what you want to do is um, get as few subjects as you can but still have a high correlation and still have a correlation that's trustworthy. So you got to be smart about your sampling, smart about your data sizes, and smart about your data gathering. And, um, you know, and if things don't show a correlation, at least, you know, you're not wasting too much time with this study. Um, so that is, uh, that is one thing to, to learn that the bigger your data size, the better your the better your uh, statistical predictions, or the better the better for you to say that hey you know you can't predict productivity with test scores, you know in other words being able to say that you cannot predict something, be even being able to say that that's that's something as well right um, that you're not trying to base things on superstition. Then you have, um, okay, there's this um, a brochure is handed out, and we see as part of their brochure some 
some snazzy da some razzle dazzle jobs gotten by certain people that all have names they make it into this brochure as a way for the school there's a school here which pr which is promoting their computer program right and these are these are people that went through that school like sarah here sarah had nine months of training her income is eighty five thousand dollars now wouldn't you like to have eighty five thousand dollars for only nine months of training or zach a programmer has six months of training and is now earning $63,000. Eli, a systems analyst, eight months of training, she's earning $72,000. As you can see here, you can just go down here. These are pretty rosy numbers. Like you have here Lynn, a network administrator, only four months of training and she's earning $60,000 a year. Now these are, these are pretty, pretty solid numbers. They're pretty nice. But what's causing that, you know? And that's the thing. There are things, factors happening outside the scope of the brochure that's probably also meaning, and, and again, we're, we're taking these numbers seriously. I'm, I'm pretty convinced there probably really was somebody named Sarah who only did nine months of training and was really earning $85,000. That's probably quite likely, right? So I'm not saying that they're lying about any of these people, okay? Let's... Let's just say that we're just giving them the benefit of the doubt, that these numbers are real, these people are real. So what's up? What, what, what could still be going on to cause these numbers to be so high? Turns out that you could say, um, you could say quite a bit actually. Uh, for example, maybe, uh, maybe some people have more, ex more prior experience with computers or better access to computers during the program while it was running. Or, um, of course, none of these months of training represent other kinds of education or the number of years on the job or things like that. You, you really, these, these numbers don't really say anything about those things. And that's giving the advertiser the benefit of the doubt. That's saying to the advertiser, okay, we trust these numbers. These are okay numbers but there's still these questions it's still even if you trust the numbers it the numbers raise more questions than they answer so you know when you whenever you do see a brochure you want to be ready to um you want to be ready to see through these sorts of uh these sorts of ads everything i just said about all these other reasons why these people could be earning so much money with so little training um, that these reasons are actually part of the idea of extraneous variables. These are variables that are external to the data but have a huge influence on uh, how these people turned out in terms of their careers. So, but then there's also something else. There's also these hidden variables. So there's extraneous variables where they're not really hidden. They're just hidden from us maybe, but they're not hidden to the person earning $83,000 a year. Um, she knows what circumstances got her into that position. Um, but then there's hidden variables which maybe aren't very known to the data. So if you see here, like let's say you have um, kids enrolled in a, in a youth orchestra and then you know out of the, these numbers of youth orchestras how many of these players become professionals in the professional orchestra so you can see here that you have 10 11 12 and then 14 the number of youth orchestras grew and grew and grew up to 20 by the year 2000 but look at the number of players becoming professionals 16 18 20 so far so good 26 32 and then it plummets like a rock to 13 and then starts to slowly get back up again. So what's going on here? What caused the plummet? You know, that's a hidden variable. Something caused that. Turns out, if you read into the question, maybe there was something you hadn't known before that one of the one of the professional orchestras went out of business, and so that caused the number of youths uh, getting hired into the professional orchestra to seriously plummet. And that's happened so you can 
you can see the graph like this one here it's a kind of a blurry graph but you can see here the numbers went up and up and up over the years and then all of a sudden plummeted and started to slowly go back up again so that's um, that was done in a um, in a software called fathom you don't need to use fathom it's good enough that you have a spreadsheet you can use Google Sheets to do to see uh, this problem for yourself okay so after that we have all of the problems by the way I will um, I will post the problems onto the timeline on um, on Google Classroom so I will not say what they are here um, that takes us to the end of chapter 3 so I have another another thing for you to do and um, I hope this one will be really good because uh, you know uh, I like the linear regression part um, and uh, my my thing will be to tell you to use um, use computer mo use computers use the um, use the spreadsheet and um, see uh, what what you can uh, get from it after this we jump all the way to chapter 7 and that will be for probability distributions which is not probability as you thought it would be it's actually part of statistics but yes it does use probability and it does use counting techniques to some small degree it's not as in your face as it was in chapters four five and six though so that's our that's our treatment of chapter three for today and i hope that um i hope that you found this chapter to be kind of kind of okay all right so see you in a bit